this is really bright. So we all needed our driver's license to get in here tonight. And so I have a question. Where do you keep your driver's license? Wallet, yeah. I keep mine in my wallet, too. And I was surprised last year to find out that it's common for African-American men to keep their driver's license above the sun visor in their car so that if and when they're pulled over, the police officer doesn't assume as they reach in their pocket that they're reaching for a gun. How did that make you feel when I brought up race? There are about 250 of us here today. I assume that about 25% have been to a Black Lives Matter protest. Maybe another 25% have talked about it on social media. But the largest percentage of us feel some combination of confusion or fear or guilt. And if I'm honest, race is still uncomfortable for me to talk about. It's funny, we're doing this project right now with the Apple Watch, and it has my heart rate. I was sitting next to my friend, and it was skyrocketing. And I'm just, it's just still uncomfortable. And the reason is, is that I grew up in a town called Rockland, California, which is over 80% white. I then went on to study at Cal Poly, which is 60%. And I work in the tech industry, which is also 60%. And I've always been part of the majority. And I've never had to think about my race in the context of where I live, where I study, or where I work. But the truth is that for a lot of people, that isn't the case. And race affects their entire experience, from the jobs that they get, to the salaries they may make, to the promotions they may receive. Most of us here work in the tech industry, and so this is really relevant. And the reality is that if we don't think about race daily, it still affects us. And I'll illustrate this from a financial perspective. So the current stat is that one in three African-American men can expect to go to prison in their lifetime. And the cost of that is $48 billion per year in the US. We spend five times more on the prison system than we spend on higher education. I just took out a whole new bucket of student loans, and I think about what could $48 billion do for higher education. I recommend watching the documentary 13th if you haven't seen it yet, if you want to learn more about that issue. But how did we get here? We've broken the human experience into fragments. Some of our previous speakers were talking about this. Where it's Republicans versus Democrats, as the recent election showed. The haves and have-nots, as we feel a lot here in the Bay Area. Men versus women, black versus white. This is where empathy comes in, where we were talking about earlier as well. So that's in social media for people to imagine a better, more connected world. And some of their responses were, imagine a world where disagreeing with someone didn't mean you hated or feared them. Imagine a world where you're not surprised where a woman is CEO. Imagine a world where tech diversity reflects the diversity of the US population. What would it take to create a reality like this? So after Cal Poly, I went on to work for a small company called Apple. And um, at the time, it was over 70% men. And so I started getting interested in gender issues as it was personal and relevant for me. And then I went to work at Square. And we started giving offer letters to new grads coming out of college that were six figures. And in the same day, I saw these eviction protests near our office and started thinking, like, why aren't these great jobs being offered to the people in our neighborhood? Like, there's a huge disconnect there. And it's a super complicated problem, and there's not a really easy, quick win, but it's something we have to start thinking about from a systemic level. And to be clear, I think there's probably a lot of hiring managers in this room, people that will be starting companies, kind of innovators. There's probably at least a different hundred companies represented here today. An unconscious bias in the hiring process, when we think of culture fit, if you don't predefine what culture fit means to you, it inherently means hiring someone just like me. And we did it for years at Square. It was part of the application process. And we also hire from referrals. The stats are over 90%. And your network is shown to be just like you. And so if we hire from referrals and we look for culture fit, we're just going to keep the cycle over and over. So I went back to school. 
to start learning about more of the issues and how we can actually start creating change. And so I don't want to depress everyone and kind of share all these negative stats, but I want to talk about some of the things we can start doing. So the first step is really starting with yourself. And we've talked about empathy here tonight. And so it involves looking inside and looking at your privileges. And privilege is a pretty loaded word. I think it makes a lot of people feel uncomfortable, especially with those who have a lot of it. <laughs> um, and privilege is defined as an unearned advantage given to some people, but not all people. So some of mine include being white, able-bodied, straight, and having an intact family. So I could feel really guilty about these things, which I have, or I could think about them as my gifts, and I can use them to create change for others. So the more gifts I have, the more change I can create, and the more power I have to change the systems around me. Another metaphor is thinking about them as my playing cards, and I can play them on behalf of other people without it negatively affecting myself. There's a bunch of studies to support that. So if I think about these as my gifts, um, you can start creating change. And I saw this happen at Square. So there's an engineering manager named Eric Burke, and he was one of our first engineers, built the Android platform, built the engineering hiring process, had a lot of insight. And the turning point for him was when he realized that African Americans could be biased against African Americans, just like whites. And it, unconscious bias is a universal problem. There's also conscious bias, but bias is a problem that everybody deals with. And when he removed guilt from the equation, he started actually learning about the issues because he wasn't at fault. And then he started changing and kind of implementing change in the company. So he built an unconscious bias course and delivered it to every single hiring manager in the company. He then went through our entire engineering process that he built and went through systemically and said, we got to change that, we, that's wrong, let's, look, let's try this, and just implementing change. And then he built the most diverse engineering team in the company. And that team was really, really happy. But that all started with him kind of looking inside and recognizing the privilege he had and what he could do to change the system around him. The next step is getting out of your comfort zone. So Michelle alluded to convincing people to do races. So I do a lot of running and triathlon. And if you've ever done any sort of athletic event like that, you know that training is going to be really, really painful, and you're going to have ups and downs, and get really uncomfortable. And the quote in sport is, get comfortable with being uncomfortable. It's only through that discomfort that you push to the next level. And so we have to get more, more uncomfortable with this process. Talking about race is uncomfortable, but it is going to help us kind of move forward as the tech industry and as society as a whole. So empathy involves putting yourself in someone else's shoes. I know a lot of people in this audience know a lot about empathy. And last year, I actually visited San Quentin State Penitentiary, which is just across the bridge. And I was alone on a Sunday, and I was actually really scared. Um, there's an amazing program there called The Last Mile, which teaches inmates entrepreneurship and technical coding skills and prepares them for transition after prison. And what was surprising to me is that after I leaving there, I actually felt more similar to the inmates than different. So I just gave a TEDx talk recently, and one of them was practicing his. And they were planning their run at Mount Tamalpais. And they were learning to code just as I was learning to code. And I learned a lot about the sad stories and this kind of twist in their life that caused them to their current reality. And I left there thinking, what can I do to kind of change that reality for them? I started thinking about my place in the system. And something that Christian, who runs our program at CCA, talks about a lot is that he was at IDEO for 10 years, at 10 years, and he was like, designers are more likely to go out and be like, oh, I got to fix the water crisis, the housing, all these things. I have the solutions. But we have all of those problems within a two-mile radius of Yelp. <laughs> I pass about 100 tent encampments on the way here. Which reminds me, this past election, we passed Proposition Q, which makes it legal now to have tents on the sidewalks. And on one side, I get it. They're not sanitary. They're not great to look at. But the reality now is that it's illegal for them to be there. And a cop can now come and give them 24 hours notice as long as he offers them a place to stay. But that only gives them a place to stay for one night. And right now at CCA, we're actually doing a project with Glide. And people line up at 3 p.m. for the hope of having a bed for one night. 
And the reason that that is is because there's over 7,000 homeless people in San Francisco and only 1,200 beds. So you look at all those tents, and what is the alternative for them? So passing a law that makes it now illegal is focusing on the symptom and not the system of homelessness that got them there. And interestingly, there were $700,000 spent to get that proposition passed. So what could we have done with $700,000? It was, mo it was funded mostly by VCs. Which brings me to my third point of solving for this system and not the symptom. How many of you are familiar with systems thinking? We're doing it a lot in school, so I'm going to use a metaphor. Um, so first, there's an event. So I'm going to use a metaphor from Square in the tech industry. So we noticed our intern class was very homogenous. It was actually... Jack tutored a picture at the time, it was all white men. Like, hey, look at our great new intern class. <laughs> um, this is in 2011. So then we looked at a trend. We actually interviewed all of our interns. This was a year later. And 100% of them had taken advanced placement computer science in high school and said it was instrumental for them in determining their future career path. So we looked in San Francisco and found that only two high schools offered APCS out of dozens which was surprising considering the tech focus in the Bay Area. And then we looked around our office, and we had moved into our big, bright, shiny new office. We had lots of empty conference rooms. We had a bunch of eager engineers. We had extra hardware. And so we decided to offer an after-school program for nine months, an APCS for local high school girls. And then we opened up the program to Square employees who wanted to learn about engineering. And they got to pair program together after school for a year. And all the girls that were in that program went on to study computer science in college. And one of the employees actually went back to school and is now an engineer at Square. So we went down to the infrastructure level and started looking at the problem locally in a more systemic way. How could we actually help solve it? And the last level is the mental models. There's been a lot of talk about why engineering in particular is so focused on men, white and Asian, typically. And it's a lot about the media and how we consume it and what, what our ideas of an engineer and this comes into bias. And so we need to also address the mental models if we're going to solve some of these problems. So I would have never imagined that I'd be up here in front of you today talking about race and privilege and design. This has been a journey. But I'm here because I'm learning that there are tools to help us kind of move forward. And it really does start with ourself. Everyone here is a part of the system, and we're all empowered to do something, even one thing, to change these systems of oppression around us. David Dinking said, race relations can be an appropriate issue, but only if we want to craft solutions and not catalog complaints. We can transform it from the cancer of our society into the cure. So for those of you who were around in 2014, I don't know how, how many of you remember this story. Um, it was in the mission. Does anybody remember? OK. Um, yeah, so basically the story is there was a group of tech employees. They booked a field, totally legit. Um, and there was this group of kids from the mission who had played there their entire life. Um, and so it got kind of national press. It was basically the us versus them, have versus have nots. It cost $27 to rent the field, which obviously these kids in the mission probably couldn't afford. And it's a, it's a perfect example of a symptom. It was the very thing happening at the top. And below it, the, the government changed the rules, and the kids can't pay for it, and, there's, and then it's back to the diversity question and inclusion. And looking back, interestingly, there I am. I used to actually book soccer fields for Square. This didn't happen to us, but... I've been on the other side. I understand why. I understand where the company is coming from. Most, more recently, I had the opportunity to meet an amazing man named Hugo Vargas. He was actually at the field that day. And since this time, actually, I'm going to take it back a step. So he was at the field that day, and where he went after back to building empathy, so he's playing soccer. He went back to an SRO. Do you know what an SRO is? 
stands for single room occupancy. So they're like former little hotels, um, not great living spaces. So they're about the size of the screen. And he lived there with his two sisters, his parents, his dog in the Mission District. So he went from that soccer field where the tech workers were kicking them off back to this room. So that was his living room. And at first he got depressed and kind of emotional. And then he was like, wow, I, I can actually do something about this. And since that day, Hugo, oops, sorry. Hugo has gone on. He joined the San Francisco Youth Commission. He got involved in the Housing and Transportation Board. He interns at a local nonprofit. He speaks at tech companies. And he builds bikes for families in need. So he started getting involved in the local issues and trying to understand them from a systemic way. And he's 17 and still in high school. So if he can do all of that with what he has, imagine what we can do individually and collectively to start changing these systems around us. We have a lot of power, and we need to move from a place of guilt to a place of power. So the next time you pull out your wallet, I ask you, what will you do with the gifts that you've been given? Thank you.